started. Wow, I'm so impressed with all of you coming here today um, for the for the talk. Um, this is the first time we switched to a dressier, nicer room, and then we suddenly have this explosion of um, turnout. Um, okay, we will be better prepared next time. We'll put a lot more chairs um, in this room. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our fall 2018 CHRC distinguished speaker, Dr. Susan Morgan. Um, she's from University of Miami, where she serves as the associate provost for research development and strategy. Until 2017, she served as associate dean for research for the School of Communication, as well as the director for the Center for Communication, Culture, and Change. Dr. Morgan's research interests involve the design and evaluation of persuasive messages targeting health behavior change in multicultural populations. Her work has been supported by over $12 million in grant funding from various sources. Wow. <laughs> Including, of course, the National uh, Institute of Health and the Department of Health and Human Services. That's, about, that's also the same thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Dr. Morgan has published over 70, uh, 70 uh, peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, and she's also the author of a book, From Numbers to Words, Reporting Statistical Results for the Social Sciences. Now, I should also mention that you didn't put this in your bio, but you're the recipient of the National Communication Association, the Outstanding Health Communication Scholar Award in 2015. Uh, let's uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Morgan. Thank you all. It's, it's very exciting to see so many people here for such a very specific sort of topic. So I hope that you'll learn some really exciting stuff um, and then you'll have a, a different perspective on the field of communication and the kind of work that we can do um, within this discipline, which always very much excites me. And I love being here and I'd love to thank my hosts. Like, you guys are amazing. This has been such a well-organized, well-polished visit. I've enjoyed really learning about what you, what you all are working on here. So it's very exciting for me to be here. So my, uh, let's see, can I change the questions? Come on. Yeah. Okay. So uh, most of you don't know me particularly well yet. Yeah. You'll learn a little bit about me today. I uh, I am not a technology person. Okay. So uh, although I enjoy uh, using Facebook as much as the next person, I'm only on Facebook. I don't. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. Uh, when SPSS comes out with their latest version, I am so mad. I hate <laughs> upgrading to any new version of anything. There's a new iPhone out. People are lined up around the block. I go, I don't want to do it. I, I know this iPhone. I don't want a new iPhone. I want to learn something new with technology. So there's a real irony in this project. Okay? And this is a very interdisciplinary collaborative project. But nonetheless, how in the world does someone like me get involved in a topic and set up uh, processes uh, like this? And so whenever you see a scholar really out of their comfort zone, you know that there has to be a backstory of some kind. Right? There's something else going on there. And my backstory involves Heather McAllister. So Heather McAllister is a really close friend of mine. She was diagnosed um, in 2004 with stage 3 ovarian cancer. And because she was this extraordinary, charismatic person, her friends all kind of came together to help try to support her. And they supported her, you know, not just in terms of social support, but provided a lot of instrumental support. So they did things like drive her to her chemotherapy appointments, they did her grocery shopping for her, they helped do her laundry. And um, Heather became uh, convinced that well, because she was uninsured, she really knew that her best hope for top-notch treatment by an excellent oncologist was to join a clinical trial. And so me, like as being, I was, pro I'm pro I was probably her only friend with a PhD. I thought, here I am, I'm a PhD, I, you know, in health communication, this I can help with. Like, I know, you know, so now we're living across the country from each other. We, we used to live in this same city, you know, and you know, but being that 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 separation, it kind of made me feel a little bit helpless, right? Like, how can what can I do to help uh, my friend? 
And so I said, I will help search for clinical trials for you. And so I got on clinicaltrials.gov, okay? And clinicaltrials.gov was such a big deal when it, when it was unveiled. And in 2004, the same year that Heather was diagnosed, it received an award from the Harvard Kennedy School. Okay? And it was cited as being a successful model for, quote, a system that processes um, and presents large amounts of specialized information to a wide range of users. And one of those users, user groups was supposed to be for patients. So patients could find clinical trials on their own and not just be dependent on physicians to recommend those trials. So I'm going to give you, show you an example of clinicaltrials.gov because I don't know, how many people have been on clinicaltrials.gov for any reason? Okay, so you, you, know, you know what this is. So I, I just did this maybe six months ago and I searched for ovarian cancer clinical trials. This is the first result that comes up. Okay? So you can kind of like, you know, you can throw a dart at the board and see what comes up. And so this says, this is a description of this study. So this is a study of hem with standard treatment in patients with recurrent platinum resistant ovarian cancer. So this is a single arm open label phase two trial to evaluate the efficacy and safety of anti-PD-1 antibody MK3475 in combination with standard of care gemcibidine and something something chemotherapy in women with recurrent platinum resistant ovarian cancer encompasses ovarian peritoneal and fallopian tube cancer. Patients will receive two cycles of this, two cycles of that, whatever, okay? So I would look through pages of this, page after page, and I would have to Google every other word, right? Here I am, a highly educated person, I couldn't help my friend find a clinical trial. So that's what got me interested in this topic. Okay? I was like, this cannot be. This is a terrible situation. This is highly disempowering for, for most people. So you might feel bad for me. Oh, you know, of course you don't. So, but why do we care? Why is this so important? Well, without clinical trials, we don't know what's an effective new drug or treatment protocol. We have no way of knowing what's a hunch on the part of your, you know, other, you know, fabulous doctor, right? Like, what's their gut feeling about something versus what does the science tell us? There's no way for us to know this without participation in clinical trials. So antibiotics, blood pressure medications, oral contraceptions, and con contraceptives, and aspirin have all undergone large clinical trials to prove their effectiveness. We take all these things for granted, but at one time they were enormous innovations. Right? And we weren't sure, we still kind of don't know how some of these things work. I guess no, we're not even sure like, how it actually works. But in 1876, the clinical trial was published <laughs> on, on aspirin. So this goes back a long way for thinking about the history of medicine. Um, but it's incredibly important that people participate in clinical trials, or from my perspective, at least make an informed decision about whether to participate or not participate. It's okay if you don't participate, but a lot of people aren't even being offered the opportunity to participate, and they don't understand what they're agreeing to or what they're refusing, okay? So my goal is really to try to increase people's understanding, and, you know, not just their awareness of the importance of clinical trials, but their understanding of those opportunities. So we have a crisis in this country with <coughs> clinical trials. And we have a lot of clinical trials that are available, but they're not accruing. So I'm going to show a little bit of data just from the University of Miami. So of the 206 data uh, studies that we have complete data on, 11% of our studies fail to accrue even one single patient. Not even one. Right? So we have all these open trials and no patients. And then just 16% of studies have met their targeted enrollment. 16%. How do you do valid statistical tests on something when you're, you're talking, with a, uh, talking about a very tiny uh, fraction of the numbers that are needed to do those tests? Uh, average accrual is just 38% of targeted en enrollment, and the median accrual rate is 24% of those target numbers. The thing is, I'm not throwing University of Miami under the bus. This is extremely typical. This is, the, this is pretty much, you know, this is, the, this is the norm for academic medical centers. We don't have enough people who are participating. So the question is why? Because we can't develop interventions. We can't figure out a way of addressing a problem 
if we don't know why the problem exists. Right? And so this is, a, this is a bit of a challenge that we experience in health communication fairly frequently. We think, oh, I see a problem. You know what would really help with that? We need to do blah, blah, blah. Right? And then we go, we're off to the races and we go to do something. But we haven't developed a really full, rich, and complete picture of what the problem really is. So I'm going to focus on a few different sets of barriers. So their patients sometimes don't want to participate in clinical trials. Okay? So they might have high levels of medical mistrust. And they might trust their own personal doctor, right? their own oncologist they might feel really good about. But maybe they have mistrust of medical institutions. Trust the system. Um, but there are also real issues when it comes to a dedication of resources. So people have to devote more time um, to, to the participation in a study, right? So it often takes more visits. And sometimes there are invasive tests that are, that are um, required, uh, that you have to find transportation to the academic medical center for those more frequent appointments. Um, and not having insurance is kind of, kind of a problem. So the complexity of a trial, like if you have to keep a food diary as part of the study, anybody ever try to do that? Uh, that's not much fun. <laughs> it's really like, you, I mean, you have to keep on top of it. Now imagine doing that for eight weeks, 12 weeks, you know, longer um, as part of the study, and otherwise you're not doing the, the, the requirements of that study. So it, in my, uh, it, it's taken a long time to review all the literature on this, so I try to synthesize this into a model. So this is where like the patient um, barriers are. But patients, it's not, it's not just related to patients. So physicians experience certain kinds of barriers. And one of the most interesting barriers that physicians face is role conflict. So a lot of physicians see themselves as healers. Right? They see themselves as people who treat patients and, and help make patients well if they're sick. They don't see themselves as researchers. So those physicians who are PIs on clinical trials, they, what the connection that they make is if I'm helping to advance the science, then I'm helping to heal my patients. And I'm bringing them better treatment options. <clears throat> but physicians are also concerned about a loss of revenue stream. So if you're a community-based physician and you refer your patient onto a clinical trial, oftentimes they have to go to the academic medical center and receive treatment from a different physician. And so that loss of uh, funds that come from providing treatment to that patient are lost, so that becomes a, a real issue. And I, you know, I'm sure you've all heard about this in the media, right? There's a new drug out, and uh, it offers like a couple extra days or an extra week of life to somebody who's terminally ill. I don't know. A lot of patients, or you know, a lot of physicians don't find that to be very exciting. So why would they take the time to explain the trial, to enroll them, have to do the paperwork, run all the tests, pursue the protocol, all the follow-ups, and everything else, just to get their patients maybe a couple days or, or an extra week of life. For some patients, that's really meaningful. But when physicians are treating a lot of patients, that might not seem all that meaningful. <laughs> also, we have to recognize that physicians are trained in medicine. They spend a lot of years get, receiving intense education and training in medicine. That intense training does not include communication. That's supposed to be something that they acquire through practice, uh, through their residency, by apprenticing with other physicians, um, and they're supposed to pick that up. But what happens if their mentors are also terrible communicators? Right? So physician-patient communication is an entire field within the, the subfield of communication, and it's really worthy of pursuit. In the context of clinical trial communication, we have another layer onto this, right? So it's not just about basic social competence and being kind, <laughs> concerned, and being patient-centered. So really thinking about how do we explain complex research uh, terminology? How do we explain randomization to patients? If you've never, if you've never done this before, how, you know, how do you do this? And especially to patients who might lack basic literacy, right? might not be so educated, might not even have a high school education. And even if they have a high school education or a college education, people don't always understand randomization. So how as a physician do you get your patients to the point where they can provide informed consent or informed refusal, right? You're, you're there and you have to do that. 
Um, also, what's interesting is that physicians are not necessarily compensated for the time that they take, because it does take a lot of extra time to present um, the, the option of, of joining a clinical trial. So if, if they have like a 15 minute slot and it takes an hour to explain a clinical trial, that's, gonna, that's a tough sell for a physician. So these are some of the, <laughs> highlighted in yellow, some of the physician related and communication related barriers. So there are also systems related problems. So infrastructure is of real concern. So you need staff, you need people to help set up a study and to run a study and to print out the consent forms and to sit down and even approach to, de to determine whether or not a patient is eligible to join a clinical trial. Um, and, and the space, like to have a private space to explain something. If, some, if somebody has particularly a stigmatized illness that would qualify them for a trial, you need to talk to them about that in a more private space. Like it can't be done out in public. Uh, the compensation rate to co cover steady costs, like all of those tests and all of those follow-ups, that's pretty expensive. And so our system is not set up to, to cover that. The identification of eligible patients, that's a problem that has to be done manually because we have no electro automatic electronic alert systems. Clinicaltrials.gov, as we just saw, does not require PIs to submit a lay summary. They don't, they don't require the PIs to submit something that's written in language that most mere mortal human beings can understand. So basically one of the problems is that physicians and patients can't easily find information about suitable trials in a language that they can easily understand. So, so you know, what can we really do about this? And so I'm not the first person to notice that there are all these different sorts of issues and that, you know, to think, okay, we, we need to look for some ways of addressing these things. So there are a number of things that we can do. So there's a kind of a whole constellation. We can do a whole set of options. Like, so what I'm doing is not the only option. Right? There are a lot of other things that can be done. And so you can do communication training with physicians and with staff and study nurses. How do you approach patients? What, how do you, what are the verbal scripts you need to use? How, how do you carry yourself? What kinds of nonverbal communication behaviors do you need to engage in? in order to build trust and build a sense of connection so that people will just like hang on long enough to in, engage in the hard work of listening about a clinical trial and, and considering that. Um, we also had a very curious experience of serving on my university's tenure promotion board for three years. And what I found is that clinical physicians who want to be promoted to the next level, so if they go from you know, like a, an assistant professor, you know, like the clinical, you know, they want to go to associate, they get rewarded for opening trials. And there's no recognition at all of whether or not anybody has ever enrolled in those trials. So lots of motivation to just crank out that stuff and open up new studies and be the site PI and everything, but nothing on actual like people. So the science isn't advancing. We're rewarding the wrong thing. And we also need to change IRB submission requirements to make sure that PIs are submitting lay summaries because we can't have effective search tools like clinicaltrials.gov if we don't have a lay summary for it to pull from. Automatic alert systems. If you're in medical informatics, you know how to do some programming tools, so you can be a rich person. <laughs> you can solve this problem. There are actually a lot of people who are working on this, um, but electronic healthcare record systems don't talk to each other. So what comes up in one system is not going to come up in the other, and they're so complicated that physicians don't want to use the proper fields. So they enter everything in a free, in a free uh, response field instead of checking off the boxes like they're supposed to, because those boxes are what would make an electronic um, healthcare, like, a, a, like an automatic alert system actually function properly. So we've got all kinds of human and technological um, issues with that. Compensation, we need to figure out how to reward physicians for actually talking um, to, to patients, and that can be, there, there's a whole set of systems that's being proposed here. But there are things that we still can't control. We can't control what the NIH pays physicians to talk to their patients about clinical trials. We can't control clinical trials that go. Like, I, I would love to have that kind of power, but you know, I, I, we don't have much hope of that. But these are mostly low-tech solutions, with the exception of an automatic alert system these don't really involve a whole lot of technology, and it certainly doesn't involve social media. So, so this is where we come in. Okay, so we're kind of trying to develop a, a different approach. So I have the best interdisciplinary research team in the entire world. Okay, so I, I mean, I guess I don't know all of them, but it's the best one that I've ever worked with, and I think that they're amazing. So this is Kim Grinfetter. He is the head of our interactive uh, media program. 
He is a web designer and he does a lot of stuff with virtual reality and augmented reality, all kinds of cool stuff. This is Wei Peng. He's one of my doctoral advisees. He's got all kinds of math skills that I'm still exploring. Like I'm like, Wei, you secretly know how to do this like a crazy thing. And half the time the answer is yes. Uh, this is Barbara Malay. She is, her PhD is in industrial engineering. She specializes in human factors and she's our user experience evaluation expert. She's incredible. This is Qinghua Chuan. She is a computer scientist. She, all these people are in, in the School of Communication, by the way. So we have a very interdisciplinary School of Communication. Um, so she's a computer scientist. She specializes in artificial intelligence and machine learning and natural language processing. Um, Aurora Appa just started her tenure track job at the University of Kentucky in health communication. I'm going to talk a little bit about some data that she gathered. Uh, and this is Soroya McFarlane. She is going to be starting at the University of Georgia in January. This is Tyler Harrison. So he's a specialist in communication design sorts of issues and um, organizational systems. How do you make changes there? Uh, not pictured, Jonathan Trent. He's an oncologist and he also heads up uh, the clinical research um, initiatives at the, uh, the Cancer Center. Um, so Yun An, who is a department chair of statistics, she's our great statistician, and Margaret Byrne, who now works for the Moffitt uh, Cancer Center, she's a health economist, so she like analyzes you know, what's the cost effectiveness and stuff, but she's also a specialist in decision making. So, very diverse team, we always have a great time together, we're always learning stuff from each other, and you'll ha have a sense of how this works. So there are six components of the CHIRP intervention. I'm going to talk about all of them except for the, the search tool because, you know, it's a search tool. So, you know, it's not that exciting. Um, the, the exciting piece of this is now we have created some institutional change. It took us three years to push for this, but now PIs do have to submit a link summary as part of their IRB submission. So it now pulls um, stuff that's relatively, uh, most of the time, <laughs> in a language that most people can understand. But we'll talk about the website, um, some whiteboard animations that are used to explain key concepts, an interactive decision aid that we developed, a chat bot, and our social media campaign. So the website itself serves as kind of a, a, like a, a framework okay, for a lot of the, the well, for all of these other components. Okay? So it's what holds everything together. It does present a lot of text. And for people who prefer to read things, like I prefer to read stuff rather than like watch a video. Like to me, it's a lot. I can read a lot faster than I can sit there and watch a three-minute video. So, um, so we we I, I developed this in partnership with Kim Gritbetter, the, the web designer, and we try to follow certain principles. We wanted it to be a nice, clean design. We wanted it easy to use, easy to navigate. We wanted to use UM colors. That we wanted the images to be of real Miamians, right? So we had all this stuff. So we were, you know, really pretty pleased with how it came out and really excited. And so when we were done with it, we turned it over to Barbara, our user experience evaluation expert, and she ran a study. Um, and she just focused on, listen, you know, are people satisfied with this? Are there any problems with the usability? And so we we're like, okay, cool. You know, we'll get get her report later, and then we'll do some final tweaks. So she did what's called a diagnostic usability test, and she, we brought in 10 cancer uh, survivors with moderate to high health literacy and some internet and, and plenty of internet experience. And so she set up a series of tasks for them to perform. And then she looked to see whether or not they were effective in accomplishing those tasks, whether they were satisfied with it. She looked to see where on the website they were looking, using some eye tracking technology, and then just noted what the usability issues were. Well, we had a big surprise, okay. Kim and I. So one of the tasks was, tell me what a clinical trial is. And they couldn't do it because our website sucks. <laughs> so we were really sad about that. So anyway, so people like floundered around all over this thing. So some of them like seen on the homepage and they were looking for it, scrolling down. Some of them tried to use a little search uh, tool over here. Uh, they, they looked everywhere, but they did see this, what are clinical trials written in white font against an orange background. So it's not a surprise that they couldn't find it. So obviously, we have to engage in a process of redesign. So the lesson here is always work with a UX expert if you're designing a website. Because now almost anybody can design a website. You know, like, you know, I've got a website like using Wiki, right? Like you can 
just like you know put in some content and you know pick a pick a cool like plat, you know design and voila you have a website. But is it effective in accomplishing the goals that, that you have? So uh, so I urge you not to take that for granted. Uh, whether you're in health communication or not, whatever if you if, uh, your website is part of your strategy for communication, uh, make sure you do that. What ended up being a, a good bit more successful right off the bat were some whiteboard animations that we developed. And we did this because it's difficult to explain scientific concepts in a way that's consistent um, and replicable and can be done with you know, a wide range of audiences. There's a lot of variability in how research coordinators and study nurses and physicians explain these concepts. We wanted to help develop not just a, a script for people to use, but a tool that they could you know, then use in clinics. It could be decoupled, obviously, from the website, and we have done this because these animations are now being shown in um, waiting rooms and at clinics all across the University of Miami health uh, care system. So, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so the goal, again, I just want to emphasize, it's not to get people to enroll in clinical trials. It's to help them make an informed decision about whether they want to do it or not do it. Okay? But we do want them presented with the option. My goal would be to have, I mean, my ultimate goal is to have 100% of all patients being offered a menu of possibilities and clear explanations of what it means to participate in a clinical trial. And then they can decide or not decide from a position of knowledge and strength, right? So uh, we also believe that animated videos can help people with limited literacy because you don't have to read a lot of complicated stuff. The visuals help to support the script. So I'm going to show you an example. steps to enrolling in a clinical trial or research study. After you've looked through our website and learned about clinical trials and research studies, you might be thinking, okay, this sounds like a good idea. Now how do I actually do this? You will want to identify possible trials or studies that you might want to join. There are a few different ways you can do that. First, you can find out about specific trials by using the search tool right here on our website. Just enter some basic information about yourself and you will see a list of studies that might be right for you. Another choice you have is to talk to your doctor, who might have an idea about a trial or study that you can join. If you are interested specifically in learning about clinical trials for cancer, you can call the information service run by the National Cancer Institute at 1-800-4-CANCER-226-237. The second step to enrolling in a study or clinical trial is to call or email the contact person who is in charge of signing the patients up for each specific study. The telephone number or email address that is given might be for the doctor or scientist in charge of the study, who is called the principal investigator. Or the phone number might be for a study nurse or research coordinator. Either way, they can give you more information about the study and how you can sign up. When you call, you will be asked some questions to see if you qualify to join the study you are interested in. For example, You are interested in. For example, okay. All right. So I'll so you get a you get a little flavor of what this is. I better um, pause it, or it's going to start up. And, um, <laughs> that's very engaging. 
And part of that is the technology, for sure, but part of this is a very talented animator named Stacy Bias. And she is really extraordinary. I mean, not only in terms of her animation abilities, but she had to figure out how to visually present some of this information. Like, what kinds of visual metaphors to create to help represent this. So if you, search, you can find other whiteboard animations about clinical trial participation, but I think what you'll notice is it doesn't have the same part. You know, it doesn't have, a, you know, it doesn't have a, a, a certain sort of friendly warmth to it that I think Stacy has brought to this project. Nonetheless, there are people who are very interested in the use of animations to educate uh, members of the public about scientific concepts. And you can search YouTube and you can find a number of these. Um, and it's all very interesting. So, and the, the scientific evidence is, is, uh, is accumulating. And there are some theories around multimedia learning that help to support this. So Aurora Aka, whose picture you saw a little bit earlier, was at the University of Kentucky, she decided to focus her dissertation on these whiteboard animations and whether or not they're effective or more effective than presenting things just in brochure form. You know, maybe it's the lay language, right? Let's just simplify the language and, and present it to people. Or maybe it's the visuals, the visuals that are helping people to understand it. Or maybe it's the actual movement. So we compared all of those, or she compared all of those, to the NIH's own website. And the NIH's information is what we grounded all of this in, because I am no doctor, right? You know, I am not that kind of doctor, right? And, uh, and before we did anything, of course, everything got vetted by our, the, the Sylvester um, Comprehensive Cancer Center people, including our, um, our collaborative partner, Jonathan Trent, our oncologist. So, she recruited a fall trips panel of cancer patients and survivors, about 1,200 of them. And so they were randomly assigned to the conditions as we looked to see uh, what those results were. And so the people who watched the animations came away knowing more, remembering more about clinical trial participation that was specific to each of the topics. So she had four topics, right? So, no, I'll see those randomization participation in clinical trials. And um, also attitudes improved. What was interesting is at that first pass, without considering any mediators or moderators, behavioral intention did not go up. Which again is kind of part of our philosophy. Like we want people to make an informed decision about clinical trial participation. You know, it's not so much that the goal is to get people to say yes. Um, but much of this mechanism is, uh, much of the, of the results were due to a mechanism called cognitive absorption. And if you're interested in entertainment education or why like the entertainment media can be so influential, we talk about something called transportation. And that's when you get sucked into a story. I always find, you know, if I just kind of want to amuse myself like just like for like 10 seconds, I'll turn on any random like soap opera in the middle of the afternoon, and I am right there. Like it takes me about like 10 seconds, and already I care about who's cheating on who, or you know, like, who's coming back from the dead, and you know, I, I, it's just crazy. So they are masters of generating transportation. And so, but this, as you can see, there's no plot. There's no like, there's no rich development of characters. Like you don't even know that we call her Gloria, right? You know, like her dad, we, we have names for some of the, these characters that, that show up in repeated animations. But, but we don't explore our Gloria's backstory, right? There's no reason for you to like particularly care about her as a person. So transportation doesn't, doesn't fit exactly. But cognitive absorption is another concept that runs a bit parallel to, uh, to transportation. And it just means that your brain is enjoying like in being in that space, okay? So anyway, so that's something that's that you can watch for in the in the literature because we're going to be exploring that further. Okay. So another um, uh, tool that we've been developing is an interactive decision aid, and the reason why we wanted to do that was because. People's decision to join a clinical trial or not is based both on their circumstances and their values. And so this is all material that I've um, based on Margaret Burns' work on decision making around clinical trial participation. When people are first diagnosed with cancer, they are overwhelmed. Right? They're overwhelmed mentally and emotionally. It's a devastating diagnosis. And then the barrage of information, it's like a tsunami of information that comes out of a, 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 an oncologist or, 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 or a physician's mouth, right? They give you all the information at once. It's like ha having a fire hydrant open, you know, right on top of you. 
and you, they ask you to make a decision very quickly about joining a clinical trial if that's one of your treatment options, or if they decide to even you know, present that to you as a treatment option. And the chances are you have to make that decision really quite quickly. Not everybody feels prepared to do that, so the easiest response is to say no, right? Like, oh, I, I can't think about that. And, and frequently, just tell me what to do. They want, they want, if they trust and like their position, they're gonna want the position to do that. That drives a certain quadrant of academia absolutely bonkers. And it makes, makes this crazy. You want everybody to like take control and responsibility of their own lives. But you know, very few of us actually went to medical school. So I don't know how you know, we're supposed to decide some of these things. So, um, so I'm going to show you the decision aid. <laughs> Sorry. So let's for the for the purposes, so it's at the moment. in information, it's going to feed back information that's directed specifically at my circumstances. So it says, oh, yay, you have health insurance. This can make things easier for you. Right? So insurance, including Medicare and Medicaid, usually covers most expenses of medical treatment, although the cost of new medicines might not be covered. You can ask us whether you sponsor this study, like the government or the drug company will pay these expenses. If you say that you don't have health insurance, it says, Listen, you know, this might restrict your options somewhat, but it doesn't eliminate the possibility of you joining a clinical trial. We can tell you, you tell us that you don't have insurance and we will find trials that might be good for you. And then we go on to the next question. If you were to join a clinical trial, would you prefer the usual treatment for, for cancer? Or would you hope to get the latest um, new treatment for your type of cancer? Or you would not have a preference over which type of treatment um, as long as there was some evidence that it would work? Because I'm an evidence-based person, so I'll go with evidence. And then it explains that, listen, people who are okay with getting either the new treatment or standard of care tend to be more likely to join a clinical trial. If you indicate that, no, you would prefer one or the other, it will actually say, oh, well, you know, you might not be the best candidate for, for joining a clinical trial. Would it be okay if a computer, instead of your doctor, chose whether or not you would get the treatment or uh, the new treatment or the standard, um, standard of care? And if I say, let's say I want my, my doctor to choose, it will say, ooh, you know, well, your doctor clinical trial navigator can explain each type of treatment. Joining a study that doesn't involve randomization or taking any med medicine can still be a possibility. So whatever it is that you say, it's very responsive by providing information that's specific to your preferences and to your circumstances. And in this way, we're trying to uh, help to reduce information overload because there's so much and it's so difficult to decide something. And we chose these topics based on several things. 
One is the literature, the published literature in this area about what's most important to cancer patients when deciding about a clinical trial or, or a research study. And we also did a number of focus groups. We did them with Spanish-speaking patients, we did them with English-speaking patients in the Midwest as a, as a kind of a contrast, right? So we tried to find those things that were the most important uh, to the, the largest number of patients. It doesn't cover every, everything, but we wanted to make something pretty, pretty brief. Okay, what about the role of family? It turns out there's not as much in the published literature on this, but there is a heck of a lot uh, it, that showed up in our focus group. So we wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to upset you know, if, if, if family concerns were there, we wanted to bring like that. Okay, so I'm going to finish this out with that. We can just like, exit on that. So at the end of this, actually, let me just, um, I'll, sh I'll show you at the end. Um, And so at the end, what it does is it gives you a little bit of a summary, okay, of, you know, here's sort of your pattern of responses. We used to have a slider bar that went from green to red, like to try to indicate to people like, oh yeah, probably a clinical trial is not the right thing for you, or like, wow, you're really well suited to consider joining a clinical trial. Um, and uh, people got confused about that as we did some focus group testing of the end result. People were like, I don't know what this is, you know, what's going on with that. Um, and also, it, it ended up being a little buggy. So sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't work, but whatever. We, so we decided to drop that. But I still kind of want to present something visual. So we're still working on that. Okay. Cool. All right. So another way that we're trying to deal with the problem of cancer information overload is uh, by creating a chatbot. So Ching Hua, our computer scientist person, who is really awesome, I. Uh, she loves chatbots, uh, and she was like, we could, we could do this to help patients figure out whether or not they're eligible to join a particular clinical trial. Because even if we have a lay summary, sometimes the inclusionary criteria has to be kind of technical, right? So, and chatbots can be really useful, not only in terms of um, sorting through a lot of routine information, but they're particularly useful in situations where people might experience stigma. So right now, chatbots have received a bunch of press because um, they're being used to help deliver therapy uh, or therapeutic communication to refugees okay, and people who have experienced a lot of trauma, um, and, and particularly, apparently, with men um, who don't want to disclose that they're really traumatized. And so they feel at ease interacting with a chatbot um, where they might not with a real human being. And so, interestingly, in Miami, when I first moved to Miami, someone told me, this is the smallest big city you will ever live in. Everybody knows everyone in Miami. And I was like, come on. And it's true. So, they, uh, so we found that our patients, our Spanish-speaking patients, were reluctant to, dis to, to, to actually talk about participating in a clinical trial with a professional research coordinator because they were afraid that that person would know somebody in their social circle who would then be telling them business. Okay? Oh, that was a barrier that I was not prepared to, to think about or to address. Right? Because it seems kind of like an HR problem, but you know, what are you going to do if that's, that's really a fact? So, uh, Ching Wan developed this, uh, this chatbot. Um, so, this is Sophia. And so she asks you some questions. So you, you get on there and you say, hello, okay, so, so who is it that you're looking for information? We fix the language stuff, because like, she's using proper English, like, we're Google, we're looking for information. <laughs> like, yeah, people will say um, So, I, and then you, you say, okay, well, I'm looking for my wife. And then Sophia asks you, is she pregnant or breastfeeding? Um, and we say, no, does your wife have any serious or, you know, unstable pre-existing medical conditions? We have to work on the lay language piece of this. But you say, like, does she have any of these kinds of conditions? And if you say yes, she says, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, your wife may not be eligible. And then it highlights, it automatically highlights, um, you know, the, at the part of the inclusionary criteria that's relevant. So uh, anyway, so she has... Uh, analyze all this data, and so the results are going to be presented at the Association of Computer Machineries Conference on Recommender Systems, which is coming up next month. Okay, so, and finally, we're planning a social media campaign. And so what we're hoping to do is to recruit uh, patients, cancer patients, to our Facebook page. If they have Twitter or Instagram, we would do the same thing. Um, we'll have, we have a lot of content that we already have planned out. 
um, that's a, another whole story. And of course, as you would expect, what we're hoping to do is to analyze which posts generate the most engagement. That's, that's fairly basic so far. But one of the, the, what I'm hoping is going to be a key innovation here is that we're going to launch this aspect of the study through a combination of uh, a couple of platforms called Move 11 and Hotjar. And they, what that allows us to do is to administer the survey to people. So they, they fill out all their information, all their like, you know, their attitudes, their knowledge, their background, their education level, da da da. Um, and then when they engage with our social media platforms and our social media content, it will, it will allow us to tie their engagement behaviors back to their individual characteristics. So we'll be able to see this interaction between the message characteristics and the individual characteristics. So do Hispanic cancer patients respond to more warm depictions of oncologists who are PIs of studies, right, for example? Or do they really like useful tools? Like the tools is that what they're you know, like being and sharing with other people? So this is a theoretical model that I've been um, messing around with for like uh, like a year and a half, and I'm still not done with it. I'm still tinkering around with it. But this is the social media piece of this, and here's how the social media piece then interacts with some of these other, uh, you know, probably for those of you who are doctoral students and faculty, these are going to look like very familiar um, uh, variables for the most part. But the, the absorption piece, you know, which is very much like related to some of the cognitive absorption, the usefulness of the post, and then will help determine whether or not they, they go viral or they get shared with other people, which then impacts social norms around um, those, uh, the behavior of actually the whole clinical trial. So future steps, we're planning to submit a funding proposal to either NCI or AHRQ. We have to decide on it, which direction we're going to go with, but we're still moving forward, as you can tell. We're already moving forward with the development, continued development of each of these pieces, um, just using cobbling together internal funding. We had a little discussion earlier today about like how I hustle like, various aspects of the university for money. So you, know, you just have to figure out where the money goes and then see if you can get five grand here, fifty grand there, you know, and then you just keep keep plowing forward. So we are also planning to apply a lot of these principles to the recruitment for precision medicine initiatives. The University of Miami recently got millions of dollars in grant funding to help recruit uh, primarily minority uh, folks to join the precision medicine uh, initiatives, which is a lot of like survey kind of work and donating a blood sample and blah, blah, blah. And so um, we need to diversify the samples. <coughs> Most of what we know about medicine is all based on white people okay? and middle class white people. So, in conclusion, while the digital divide still has profound impact on access to digital resources, technology can nonetheless help improve informed consent to clinical trials and research studies by improving patients' access to information that would otherwise be difficult to obtain. So, um, always looking for other thoughts, ideas, potential collaborations. So, thank you very much. Um, I just have a question regarding the uh, power of interpersonal communication Absolutely. and personal trust. You know, I always tell my students as much as we are all excited about this new wave of digital communication and communication revolution, sometimes it seems to me we overcredit the new media with a lot of things that really at the end of the day Absolutely. we depend very much on our networks of interpersonal communication Absolutely. and those that we trust the most right. to get this information. So I wonder if uh, we can figure out any place for the power of interpersonal communication yes. and personal trust in this process. So you're speaking my language. Um, so yeah, anyway, I've, I've actually written on this topic of the false divide between mass media approaches to health communication and um, interpersonal communication. And so this is one piece of a, a very layered, multi-dimensional um, approach. So we've actually already designed and pilot tested an interpersonal communication training program. So we're trying to help uh, research coordinators, study nurses, physicians, and other medical staff to communicate better one-on-one. -on -one. Because this helps people who are very self-motivated, who really want to do a lot of this kind of background work themselves and seek out information and share it really easily because not everyone can crowd into the, the physician's, um, the, the exam room. Although some people try, right? You know, but there's still like room for maybe, but like if you really smush in, maybe six people, 
But for a lot of people, that, that social network, that, that family network, is considerably larger. And not all the relevant people can be there. So we wanted to have stuff that was going to be easily shareable and perceived as being useful to a, to a wide number of people. Nonetheless, even the people who engage in this fully, right, they're all on board, and they love it, and it's great, and they're learning stuff, they will still want to talk to their doctor before they agree to join a clinical trial. So without that interpersonal communication piece, it could all still go pretty south, okay? So I used to, um, some of you might be aware, I used to be um, in very involved with organ donation research. And one of the things that we helped to, my team and I helped to make happen was uh, for the, re, the clerks at DMVs to ask you the question, um, would you like to be an organ donor? You know, like sign here or click here on the little you know, the keypad thing. And so what we discovered pretty quickly was that the clerks would start up going, you don't want to do this, do you? <laughs> Completely undermined, like the, like the whole intervention. And so one of the problems, so we ended up doing a lot of, to, to um, teach clerks about organ donation so that they would feel more comfortable with it as they were talking with it. But we couldn't prevent the problem of, pay, of, uh, of um, members of the public asking the clerks any questions. Mm -hmm. They would then want to be educated by the clerks. So that's not the clerk's job. They can't, they can't be doing that. So we had to do a better job of, of doing public education, which we then did. And, and then we changed our tactics right, in a different way. But that interpersonal uh, component, you can't ever get away from. Right? So you have to think about that as part of a, you know, a, a multi-dimensional system. So absolutely. of these Hail Mary, you know, kinds of, uh, you know, drugs and people take a big risk and they find that it, it ends up being effective and it becomes one of those blockbuster treatments. So, but really what, what you need to be doing is thinking about know, as an altruistic sort of thing. But if it's, if it's really your only hope, then it can be a really great thing. So it really just depends a lot on of values. uncertainty, so how do you yes. communicate that? So it again, it becomes a very classic problem in science communication. Exactly. And there are a lot of people working on how do you construct consent forms so that people can understand them because this is one of the things that frightens um, patients that are being asked to participate in a clinical trial is some of these documents are 30 or more pages right? and they feel like they're buying a car, right? Or they're like they're signing over something and they feel like they're signing a contract that's going to obligate them to something that maybe they might want to get out of later. So we had to do want to maybe do a better job of making it friendlier and explaining what it is, right? And the rest of the animation that I'm going to show you it actually does uh, go through those concepts. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.